Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. This morning, we would like to welcome you all to the sanctuary of the Most High God. He is delighted he to is see here. you all come before his presence. His words are, enter into my courts, he had, with praise and thanks. This morning, I would like to wish you to humble yourself before the Supreme God and know that he is here. Even though you may not feel him, he still come each Sabbath to touch us and to heal us. In the, he, he says that unto thee that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. If you believe it, it will be done. Let us know that he's here. Humble ourselves and hear him as he speaks to us. My children and I are going to welcome you again with a call to worship. Okay. We... No. We prepare. No. No. Hello, my name is Rhoda, and I will be reading the call to worship. Prepare now, for the great God of eternity is calling out to his realm. We must ask, will this hurt us? Not at all. His thundering call will embrace all who wish for it. Then let us be thunder. We will not doubt.
Our next song is going to be None But Jesus. In the 
Today, our last song will be Beautiful Things. We need to tune our guitar. <laughs>
much for being with us today. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to speak at an event in uh, another conference for a conference-wide youth thing, and they brought in about three kids' praise bands, and it was evident they hadn't worked nearly this hard. No, I mean, it, they, you know, it really, uh, it's evident. You worked hard at this. And by the way, if you ever have a chance, I talked to the kids this week about this, if you ever have a chance to see the Sermon Spice video clip that was created off of that last song that they just sang, it is breathtaking. It's, it is so just challenging and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tomorrow evening, of course, uh, we have an opportunity. We're opening the doors to the community, and we'd love to have you here, not just to be blessed and inspired and enjoy Michael Card, but also to be excellent hosts for our community. It'd be a wonderful thing. Michael has had long shelf life, and I was talking to Responsa this morning about this. I think the reason that he has long shelf life, why he's been around so long and still is in demand, is because he's, he, he doesn't believe he's a musician, he's a teacher. That's what's important to him, is to teach. And uh, even, even if you say, well, yeah, I'm, I, music's okay with me. Uh, no, you will be taught. Michael will teach you. It's wonderful stuff. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Thank you so much, Ron. Happy Sabbath. The offering today is for World Budget, AUC, and with an emphasis on ADRA, Disaster and Famine Relief. In the news, we are often overwhelmed with images of misery and pain. <clears throat> Most global headlines are about conflict, suffering, and death. Annually, millions around the world needlessly suffer from hunger and are displaced by disaster. Statistics tells us that hunger kills more people than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. Millions more suddenly find themselves victims of a disaster, now left with nothing more than the clothes on their back. Do you find yourself wondering what you can do to help someone in need? In cases of emergency, the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, ADRA, is there to show God's love and mercy to the suffering. Following the example of Jesus, ADRA is able to help an estimated 20 million people annually. In over 120 countries around the world, ADRA feeds the hungry, shelters the homeless, educates the literate, provides health care to the sick, protects the innocent, and gives hope to the hopeless. Through our offering this morning, we are partnering with ADRA to become an agent of hope and healing today to men, women, and children like Jesus did while he was on earth. At this time, our deacons will come forward to collect the tithes and offering.
heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, on the occasion of Mother's Day's weekend, we are grateful for all the mothers in our congregation, in our lives, and in our communities. We lift to you the heart of every mother who's had watched her child die from hunger, and every woman who stands in protest against a world that harms her children. May our gifts touch the lives of children, women, and men today, all over the world, and bring hope in a tangible way to those who need it the most. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before the children come forward, I would just like to remind the parents that next week there is Children's Church down at SLA, so that will be taking place, and we hope that you can support it. The children can come forward. boys and girls. How are you doing today? Good. Do you know somebody who's really strong and brave? Who do you know? Jesus is really strong and brave. How about a person in your life who's really strong and brave? Your daddy. Oh, your mommy. Well, did you know that sometimes strong and brave people don't have to be adults? They can be little people too. And I want to introduce you to a hero of mine, and she doesn't know that I'm going to do this, so I hope she's not too embarrassed. But I'm gonna ask Mia DiMartino to come up here. Could you come up here, Mia? I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Mia. If you don't know, Mia is actually very, very talented in gymnastics, aren't you, Mia? But she actually works very, very hard to be talented in gymnastics. And she practices, I am told, up to eight hours a week. Is that true? Close to? Yeah? OK. She loves gymnastics, and she's very, very good at it. Well, what you might not know is that Mia is supposed to be competing right now in nationals, because she qualified to compete in nationals right now. But Mia decided, and she made this decision, that she would rather honor God with her time this morning and be here in church than honor herself at nationals. And Mia, I just want to tell you, I'm really, really proud of you. And your strength makes all of us stronger. It really does. And you are a witness and a leader and I'm really proud of you, and your church family is proud of you, and I'm pretty sure that if you would have competed today, you would have got a medal. But I made you a medal, and it's what I call the Faithful Heart Medal. And I'm really, really proud of you, so thank you for being a witness for all of us. Let's give her another hand.
There's some other people here who are also strong and brave, and we celebrate them this weekend, and those are our mothers. And they're all strong and brave because they birthed you all, and that's a scary thing to go through. But they're also strong and brave because every day they have challenges that they don't know what to do, but they do them anyway. And we're really proud of our mothers. So today, kids, I need your help to pass out flowers to all the mothers in this congregation, but not just all the mothers who have children, but also all the mothers who don't have children, who take care of us and watch out for us and help us be better people. So we're going to do that now. Okay, you can come up here and you can get a rose and you can take them to all of the mothers, not just the mothers who have children, but also the mothers who don't. I'm doing this. Kids make all, sure all the women have them. All the women have them, okay? There might be some people up in the balcony. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. For the call to worship today, I would like to invite you to stand 
And while we are standing before we sing the uh, prelude to call to prayer, I would like you to choose someone beside you, ahead of you or behind you as your prayer body. And when we finish singing the call to worship uh, song, we would like to, I'd like to invite you to pray with that person and for that person. So please stand with me and sing, Change My Heart, O God. like to invite you to pray with that person you have chosen one or two minutes and then I will finish off with a prayer. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we come to you today on this beautiful Sabbath morning to give you praise and to worship you. We come to you with hearts full of gratitude and thanksgiving for your guidance and protection during this past week. We're thankful for this special day set apart to renew our spirit and spend time with you. We give our grateful praises to you for all the mothers in our pews and our communities, for their loving hands that have worked so hard in raising us, cared enough to correct us, bless us in ways we did not fully understand as children, and who have made us who we are today. Father, we also lift up to you those among us who are going through difficult times, including illness, loss of physical ability, loss of financial security, or the loss of a loved one. Please help us to remember how your compassion and faithfulness have never failed us in the past, and give us the comfort and strength of your steadfast love and mercy. We also ask for your blessing on those who are away for military service, and for those who are studying or are serving as missionaries overseas. Bless those who have joined us through the electronic media as well. Lord, may you open our hearts to receive the message you have in store for us through your faithful servant, Pastor Pate, and may, me, may we draw closer to you every day. 
And through this coming week, O Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may touch the life of others for good through the words we speak and love all through the life that we live. All this we ask in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Apostles, the man Thomas. Good morning, my name is Chip Ates, and I will also be reading the part of one of Jesus' apostles. You know him as Andrew. Good morning, my name is Dwight Crichton, and I will be serving as your text master of the day. Our living word passage of the day is taken from the prophet Joel, chapter 3, 
verses 16 and 17. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. Andrew, did you see that? See it? Of course I saw it. No, really, Andrew, I mean, did you really truly see it? Because I didn't. Thomas, you aren't going to tell me that you had your eyes closed, did you? Uh, no, man. Uh, actually, I kind of ran, and I, I can't believe you didn't. Well, the truth be told, I was really tempted to run, but I think Peter got in my way. Kind of turned, but I didn't really get away. So yeah, I kind of saw it and kind of didn't. I tell you, Andrew, I didn't sign up for this. When Jesus called us up at the lake region, I thought it was going to be one magnificent day after another. I mean, he talked about how God loved us and it sounded so good, I had no idea that he would actually do things that were a little bit scary like this once in a while. Well, I know what you mean, Thomas. His view of God was so refreshing that I never expected him to actually thunder like that. It was all a little overwhelming. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. His words were so comforting and such a new presentation of God that I never thought it ever shake me, it ever take me back to my fears and my childhood like that. Man, this is about the third time that's happened. I don't really like it when Jesus turns serious like that. I know what you're saying, but Thomas, but uh, I also notice something when he does. What's that? Whenever Jesus gets intense, it gets scary, but it doesn't last long. I always know that I want to come back to him and be close to him. It's just weird. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be with the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. I guess you're right. Even when he terrifies me with something, the fear just doesn't last that long. It's like he kind of puts me in my place. Then he knows I'm ready to come back to him again. Man, you're right. How does he do that? The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be with the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. May this, the word of Christ, speak to each of us today. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, choir and Bob and everyone who's participated today and helped lead us in worship. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can spend just a few minutes going back to review something that we probably ought not to forget. Um, we probably, probably might wish to at times, but we shouldn't. And so we... we we pause for a reminder this morning. We pray in Christ's name, amen. About 25 years ago, 30 years ago, there was a man who burst on the scene of North American Christianity uh, with uh, a theme that just kind of shook everybody, and nobody expected it. He was, he's a Presbyterian theologian, uh, really quite a good scholar. Uh, grew up in the, I think, the rough and tumble streets of Philadelphia and has a kind of a snarly Philadelphia persona and accent and all this kind of thing. But uh, he became a, a great renowned scholar, ended up doing his doctorate at Oxford or somewhere like this over in Europe. And uh, R.C. Sproul, uh, who now lives in Orlando area. And R.C. did something that was completely unexpected, and it, it's kind of why people came to know who he was, because he was the only kid on the block talking about this. He says, you know, he says, everybody, we're so enamored, and, and that's not a bad deal. We're so enamored with the love of God. I, I, how cool is that? I mean, to, to be drawn and to acknowledge and know the love of God and the embrace of God. He says, we're so enamored with that that maybe we've forgotten something else. When you look in the Bible and you see the times that a word is repeated, verily, verily, I say unto you, it's like this is bold and it's, it's underlined and it's extra. Please pay attention to this. 
Simon, Simon, Satan hath dis, dis, de, uh, desired to have you that he might sift you like wheat. So, you know, Simon, Simon, uh, Abraham, Abraham. Uh, whenever a word is repeated in the Bible, it's kind of slapped in, in bold letters, and it's like, notice this one. And R.C. pointed out, he says, you know, yes, God is love. But never in the Bible does it say God is love, love, love. But in the Bible, several times it reminds you he is holy, holy, holy. Maybe we're not supposed to forget that. God so loved the world that he gave. It was a, it was a fresh view. I mean, as the gentlemen were reiterating in the scripture, it was a fresh view that Jesus brought to the table. Uh, the, the children of Israel on down through the apostles, they had this long-held awareness of the holiness of God and the expectation and demand of God. I mean, in their heritage, they'd heard the stories about the mountain that, that rumbled and, and burned and thundered and the, the voice and, and, and that brought down the nation of Egypt and the, the breath that split the Red Sea that sent enemies in flight ahead of it. That, I mean, they knew those stories. And more than that, they also knew the backside of it, which was if you don't obey, bad stuff happens and the bottom falls out. And God at times thundered on his people when they didn't have their act together and they had to pay the price of offending a holy God. And so they knew those stories. It was part of, their, part of what they caught from the time that they were little tiny kidlets. They knew that God was big and he was powerful and he could flex his muscles. They knew that. And then Jesus came in with this view that they'd not really seen before. Love, embrace, daddy. They'd never heard that one. That was all a fresh new, new slant of God, a new viewing of God that Jesus, and, and none of them had any awareness of that. And it was so appealing and so attractive. Jesus spoke of the adoption. In your world, in my world, when we adopt somebody, uh, I have two sons, Jeremy and James, okay? Uh, and, and if along the way, Sandy and I would have adopted, my, 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 Sandy's actually this weekend, Mother's Day weekend, she's with the kids. They're sitting in church right now, although they're probably out. But uh, anyway, um, they, um, she's with the kids. And my youngest son, James, they've actually semi-adopted a little guy. We, about a year ago, picked up a new grandkid who was a year and a half old. Uh, Adrian, he's a sweet little guy. He actually is. He's a sweet little guy. But we didn't see this one coming. And so we've got DG, Davy, my, my oldest grandson, and, and Zachary, and then you got Jenna, and you got Autumn. I mean, these are our natural, those are, those are our kidlets. You know, I, I just, you know, you'd live and die for those kids. But then all of a sudden, Adrian got introduced into the family system. And he's actually a sweet little guy. But see, in, in in your culture, in our culture, when, when we speak about a child being adopted in, we think, okay, if it really is the real deal, if Adrian, which it isn't quite in their situation, but if Adrian was fully adopted into their family, Adrian would be equal to Davy, Zachary, Jenna, and Autumn in that world. That's not in the world of Jesus. In the world of Jesus, when someone was adopted, it was for the purpose of exceeding above the original children. The Roman emperors would adopt someone for the purpose of them being the next emperor, not my worthless son. When somebody was adopted in the Roman system, they excelled above the natural lineage. You and I don't catch that in the Bible. And so when Jesus speaks of the adoption into the family of God, immediately, you know, the, these Jewish disciples, they went, time out. That means God intends to put us at a status, at a level above the angels. Are you kidding me? And so this was such a refreshing view. It was such a new, like I've never heard that before. And so when Jesus would say things like, God so loved the world, then John later on would write, beloved, the love of God is all over us. First John, just Ellen White uses the phrase, she says, when John sat down to write, it was though he was writing with a pen dipped in love. 
That's her phrase, a pen dipped in love. It was so amazing to think that this great, transcendent, amazing, ultimate, supreme, everything being actually likes us. Wow, that was, that was unheard of. And so the New Testament, certainly we gravitate toward those passages. God has commended his love toward us that while we were yet enemies, he sent his son. We love the passages of the love of God, which is, yes, it is, it's huge. But once in a while in the gospel stories, Jesus would flip the switch and he would remind them, you're dealing with God. Let's not get casual about this. You're dealing with God. Every once in a while, you'd have an experience where there would be just a flash, a moment, and everybody would fall back. When he would calm the storm, when he would cast out demons, when he would confront those who were selling stuff in the sanctuary, every once in a while, with the guards in the Garden of Gethsemane, every once in a while, he would remind them, you're dealing with God. Don't ever forget this. In all of the wonderful, real, significant truth of Scripture that this God actually likes us, as the bulletin cover says, he remains a lion and never a fully tame one. I, I recently was reading part of a book where the author equated God to plutonium. This is dangerous stuff. This is stuff that could destroy everything in its presence if God would not choose to hold it back. The stories of the Bible, uh, Leviticus 10, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Ooh, he likes us. He wants to be with us. How cool is that? Yeah, but don't bring me strange fire. Leviticus chapter 10. It's the only episodic story of the book of Leviticus. Nadab and Abihu got a little casual about thinking who, reminded her and who they were dealing with. Don't bring me strange fire. Just don't cross that line. And they paid the price. Ananias and Sapphira thought they could kind of renegotiate with God in Acts chapter 5. No, no. No, you're dealing with God. Please turn with me in your Bible. Exodus chapter 32. He's a marvelous lion, but has never been tamed. Exodus 32. Moses gets near the camp, verse 19. And he looks down and he sees they're partying. And they're partying for the wrong reason. What is this, verse 21, that these people are doing? Man, you're right here in the shadow of the mountain where God thunders. Are you doing this? Are you kidding me? This isn't going to happen. And so verses 25 and onward, it was dealt with and was dealt with decisively. And then Moses turns to go back up to the mountain, verse 30, because he says, you know, I think I better go back and talk to God about this one. Uh, God's up there and he is not happy right now. And I better go serve as your mediator. I better go up and try to mollify. You're dealing with God. Can you believe right here at the base of the mountain, you've done this. I need to see if I can turn his wrath. I shall go up and make atonement for your sin. Moses returned to the Lord and he said, God, we've got a problem. The people have sinned. And they've sinned right here in your presence. They got really sloppy and casual about, Lord, are you, no, I'm sorry. Your people have sinned. And yet I'm asking you, because I know you are plutonium. I know how severe and serious it is to deal with the holy God. I've been near you. I can feel the radiance coming off of your presence. 
I have a better understanding than they do. They've crossed the line and they don't know who they're dealing with. So I beg you, please, if you have to destroy somebody, take it out on me. Yet now, if thou wilt, forgive their sin. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. If you've got to take it out on somebody, take it out on me. And Lord, if you're going to take it out on them, take it out on me too, because I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. And if you go in the next few verses, God actually holds this test and temptation out to, to Moses, which is pretty impressive. God looks and says, Moses, get out of the way. Get out of the way, because I'm going to fry those people. But I, Moses, I've got, I got something for you. You've been faithful. And because you've been faithful, let me make this, this offer to you. I promised that out of Abraham, I would continue his seed and his name forever, okay? Well, if I eradicate all these people, but Moses, what if I don't eradicate you? What if I keep you? You're out of the line of Abraham. You're of the tribe of Levi, the grandson of Abraham, okay? So what if I keep you? And then I can still keep my word to Abraham because I've kept one lineage out of Abraham through Moses. And Moses, you get to be the father of the nation. You get to be the new Abraham. And it will forever after be known as your nation. Read it. It's actually there. I will cause a great people to come out of thee. He's offering this, dangling this test before Moses. Step out of the way, Moses. Let me make you the new Abraham. We can start over fresh and clean. And Moses shakes his head and says, that's not the God I knew. And God smiles and says, you're right. Just testing you. You're right. That's not who I am. Moses, at that moment, is so astounded at what just happened. He was offered everything, and yet, yet he did the right thing, and God is pleased, and God's not going to fry the nation. And Moses all of a sudden puts two and two together, and he says, wait a minute, I, I saw a burning bush, and I saw parted Red Sea, and I saw ten plagues, but God, I've never seen you. If I have found favor in thy sight, let me see you. Lord, you just told me I found favor in your sight. I passed the test. You offered me the most incredible opportunity, but it wasn't you. It wasn't really you, and I called you on it, and you thanked me for calling you on it because you wanted to show that side of yourself. And so I, I, I've done a good job. Lord, if I've done... If I have pleased you, if I found favor in thy sight. There's one thing I haven't been able to have. Let me see you. And God looks and says, no, 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 no. You, don't, you still don't know what you're asking for. What you're asking for can't happen. For no man shall see me and live. Moses, you have quite an elevated opinion of who I am. And that's good. But you're still not there. Because if you see me, it's going to kill you. No man shall see me and live. But I'll tell you what. If you step back in this rock, hide back in this little crevasse, peek around the corner a little bit, put your hands up in front of your eyes and, and squint real tight, just for a moment, I'll give you something no one else has ever seen. And when you read in Exodus 34, the voice that's, that comes rolling out as God, the Hebrew emendation is, God, he says, I will cause my back to pass before you. The Hebrew emendation means God was running away from him. He saw God running away because that's all he could take. God retreating and running away as fast as God could get away. And Moses just got a for a moment, a snapshot of the backside of God as God ran away because that's the only thing that would preserve Moses was for God to run away. We're dealing with a holy God. Yes, God is love, but he's holy, holy, holy. He's transcendent. And we're never supposed to forget that. We're never supposed to go grow casual about that. 
The day will come when God won't just have to run away from us, with his, just showing us his backside from a great distance, because that's all we can take. Because we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We'll be transformed in a way that we can handle the presence of God. He will have burned enough trash out of us that we won't be destroyed by the plutonium. He'll get it done. So there's that last little moment of the final removal because everything that corrupts is going to be destroyed and he's got to get the last little vestiges of corruption out of me. And when he does that, and when he does it in you, then we can see him face to face and sit on the great mountain of God with him. And it is no threat to us. And we are no threat to him or his throne and never will be. Beloved, it doth not yet appear. For, for, for this we know, we are, that God loves us and he sent his son to be the propitiation of all things. But it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we'll be like him. We'll be enough like Jesus that the holy God cannot be a threat because we'll be transformed. The love of God is, it's the fresh message of Jesus. But that fresh message never one time eliminated the great depth that he has transcended and he's holy. And then when it comes to disobedience and rebellion and sin, God will not remain, otherwise there will be destruction. That's why Jesus is alone in the dark on the cross. God couldn't be near his son. Not when you become sin. Yeah, Sunday morning, everything changed. Our closing hymn is hymn number 88. Revelation 21, 
uh, there came to me one of the seven angels who used to hold one of the seven vials in which was the seven last plagues. But he says to me, I'm done with that job now. I've got a better one. I've got a happier one. Come with me. Come hither. And I want to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he took me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem that had descended from God out of heaven, having the glory of God just with stones and gates and four square and foundations and a tree and a river. And, and there I saw the Lord God Almighty, verse 22, and the Lamb. And the city didn't need anything else. Had no need of sun. Didn't need anything else. If, if it's got God and the Lamb, that's enough. The nations of the saved walk in the light of that place without danger and without risk. Kings of the earth bring honor and glory to this place. And the gates will not be shut day nor night. The glory and the honor of the nation shall be there. And nothing that enters there will defile. Because everything that would defile has been eradicated. And we'll abide in the presence of the holy and transcendent. Astounded and unworthy and safe and embraced. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for the magnificent, fresh message of Jesus about your love and, and the adoption. And, but Lord, in, in all of this, please, as gently as you can, remind us who we are and who you are. Help us never to forget that, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.